Remember how last episode I said one of the rules to being a judge is you have to be an able-bodied man? Well, this episode we're going to see one judge who breaks that rule. Deborah is a fascinating figure, not only because her story is a nice example of female empowerment in the mostly male-dominated Bible, but also because her story is one of the most ancient parts of the entire book. And I'm not just talking the book of Judges, but the entire Hebrew Bible. So why don't we find out just how her story goes? Mythology with Mike is funded entirely through fan contributions from viewers like you. If you want to support the channel, consider donating on Coffee, Super Thanks, or becoming a YouTube member or patron. All links are in the description below. Thank you. Deborah's story takes place in Judges chapters 4 and 5, but these two aren't two parts of a longer story. They're instead two versions of the same story. Judges 4 is an account of Deborah's story in prose, while Judges 5 is a poetic version of Deborah's story. Of these two, Judges 5 is the older version, but I'll get into how scholars came to that conclusion later. To start off with, as I mentioned last time, Deborah's story begins after the death of Ehud. So poor one out for our boy Shamgar, who's already been forgotten not even one sentence after his appearance. It's been over a century after the Israelites initially came into the Holy Land, and once again, they've started worshipping foreign gods. So once again, Yahweh sends a foreign nation to conquer them. I should add some historical context. This episode's villains are the Canaanites, but to say they're a foreign nation is slightly misleading. Canaanite is an umbrella term for people who lived in this region of the ancient world, and because of that, the Israelites are technically Canaanites. To make the telling of the story simpler for myself and for your understanding though, I'm going to treat the Canaanites as a foreign nation to the Israelites, even though technically this is like if Americans were fighting New Englanders. One is just a subset of the larger group. The Canaanites had a powerful weapon on their side. 900 chariots, which are basically the ancient world's version of a tank. They're wicked fast and usually have two people, one steering the horse and the other shooting arrows. 900 isn't a lot in terms of massive armies, but the Israelites are still a disunited tribal people at this point. So even though 900 isn't a lot in terms of sheer numbers, the Israelites are still relatively small, so it evens out. To make things worse, the Canaanites also have a very smart general, Sisera, leading the charioteer army. After 20 years of subjugation, the Israelites once again ask God to deliver them from their oppressors. Yahweh hears their pleas and answers by appointing the prophet. Yes, Deborah is a prophet. Deborah acts as the leader of the Israelites, settling disputes and acting as Yahweh's mouthpiece to the people. Eventually, the time for liberation came and Deborah called upon a man named Barak to lead an army against the Canaanites. At first, Barak refused this call, which annoyed Deborah. She reminded him that with God on their side, he would bring them victory. But Barak insisted he would only lead an army into battle if Deborah led it alongside him. Deborah agreed to this, but said that because Barak didn't have faith in God to lead them to victory, this military victory would not be his, but instead it would be a woman's victory. The day of the battle eventually came. Deborah and Barak led 10,000 men against 900 chariots of Sisera's army. Yahweh really does hand the battle to the Israelites, because 900 chariots versus 10,000 men are incredibly in favor for the Israelites. Even if you take into account the fact that chariots are the ancient world's tanks, it's not looking very good for them. On a flat playing field, this is already looking bad for the Canaanites. But when I tell you that the Israelites are defending on a hilltop, meaning the chariots have to fight uphill, yeah, it doesn't take a tactician to know this is a terrible situation for the Canaanites. Now that I've set up the unfortunate situation Sisera has found himself in, you'll be unsurprised to learn his army was slaughtered. The Israelites killed Sisera's men by the dozens, and he saw how the wind was changing, and he fled the battlefield to the tent of an ally. Inside the tent was only his ally's wife, Yale. Sisera thanked her for the safety and decided he would take a nap. While Sisera slept, Yale drove a tent spike through his temple, killing him. By the time Barak caught up with the retreating Sisera, he burst into the tent only to find that Yale had already killed him. Barak accepted that his glory was gone, and he returned to his army. Yahweh, through Deborah, then led the Israelites to overthrow their Canaanite oppressors, and they sacked the city of Hazor. That's Judges 4's version of the events. And Judges 5 
aka The Song of Deborah, is the same story, just with a few minor differences here and there. The most major difference being that Yale killed Sisera while he was awake instead of waiting for him to sleep, but the method of murder remains the same. There is another, vastly more interesting, yet subtle detail in Judges 5. In Judges 5, there's a verse where Deborah name drops the tribes of Israel who helped her win this fight, and curses the tribes of Israel who didn't. But the really odd thing about this passage is that only 10 of the traditional 12 tribes are mentioned. The tribes praised for helping are Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh, Issachar, Zeblun, and Naphtali. The tribes cursed for not helping are Reuben, Gilead, aka Gad, Dan, and Asher. There's also an extra name who's not associated with any tribe ever mentioned in the Bible, Meroz. Historians aren't quite sure who they are. Their best guess is it's a neighboring nation who was later conquered by other foreign powers. The strangest thing about this callout section though is who it doesn't mention. Levi, Simeon, and Judah. Now, Levi was a priestly tribe, so they likely didn't need to show up because they weren't fighters. Simeon and Judah are less easy to explain. Simeon was completely surrounded by the territory of Judah, so I imagine Judah would limit Simeon's activities given the chance. There's not much you can do when you're completely surrounded by another territory. Now, those of you who know the biblical narrative know Judah is a very striking omission from this list. Judah is one of the two tribes who would make up the southern kingdom of Judah during the monarchy period, and it lasted much longer than their northern counterpart, the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah was also specifically where David came from. You may have heard of David before, he was only just the most famous king in all of Israel's history, he even has a big statue made of him. Judah is portrayed very favorably later in the Bible. Not only do they stay loyal to Yahweh longer than the Northern Kingdom did, but many scholars agree that the Bible was codified by Judahites, so it's weird to see that they were omitted from this poem. This has the implication that the 12 tribes of Israel weren't always 12, but that's a topic so large it deserves a video all on its own. And in order to keep this short, and keep me mentally healthy, the short answer is Judah was likely omitted from this list because they were not a member of the historic tribes of Israel at the point when the story was written. Think of Israel as an alliance that Judah was not yet a part of. The fact Meroz is included in this list, even though they aren't included anywhere else, and they don't have a son in the original story of the tribes of Israel, further supports the idea that the entity that was the tribes of Israel was more likely a confederation or an alliance which had a varying number of people at any given point in time. This section also begs the question, why did some tribes heed the call to battle but not others? Some historians suggest it could be due to economic reasons. Tribes like Gad and Asher were connected to the sea, so they weren't as affected by Canaanites as much as the other tribes would have been. But personally, I don't think this argument holds much water, pun definitely intended, because Manasseh has a large coastline too, but they helped Deborah fight. Also, Reuben and Gad have no connection to the sea at all, but they didn't help either. Reuben was a small tribe, so it could be that they didn't want to risk losing more warriors in a failed rebellion, but we don't know their own reasons because they didn't write this as far as we know. Even if you accept that this is a primary source from the battle, our source is someone who actually fought in the battle, so of course they're going to want to praise people who helped them and make those who didn't look bad. We're looking at it through a biased lens, but unfortunately that's all we can do. Some may also be tempted to say that Judah didn't help because they were too far south to reinforce the armies. And while yes, they were definitely the most southern tribe, the fact they weren't mentioned at all is what's weird about this chapter. Deborah would have mentioned them had they helped or not, and the fact she didn't is what raises some historians' eyebrows. There's so much more I could talk about with this callout verse, but we gotta get going. I haven't even talked about why we know this is one of the oldest pieces in the Hebrew Bible yet. The reason why historians know this is an ancient piece of literature is because when they examine it in the original Hebrew language, the grammar of the song is much older than the surrounding chapters. It would be like if you were reading current modern English, and then Shakespeare showed up out of nowhere. This isn't too surprising when you remember this is literally called the Song of Deborah, 
so it's incredibly likely that it was passed down via oral tradition before being written down. It was probably a poem originally, and the poetic wording doesn't have to follow regular grammatical rules, meaning that words can be more loose and free-flowing. Based on the idea this was likely an oral tradition, and given the subject of the song, particularly Deborah's call-out verse, it's likely this is a real song from the time before the Israelite monarchy, roughly 1200 to 1000 BCE. Okay, we've talked about the history of the song, but not the song itself. So before this video is over, we're going to explore the makeup of the song together. The song of Deborah is split into seven stanzas, with a few extra verses inserted here and there. The song presents itself as Deborah and Barak singing together over their victory. The first verse introduces the song, but the first stanza, verses 2-5, to five, introduce Yahweh as coming from the south. This tells us a lot despite only being three verses. For starters, it uses the four-letter name of God, which I've been referring to him by. The Tetragrammaton. This is noteworthy, because God has multiple names in the original Hebrew, and depending on what name is used, you can get an idea of who wrote that verse and when it was written. The fact that his name is written out instead of Adonai means this is probably an older piece of literature. Verses 6 to 8 mention Shamgar, and while you might think that means he wasn't a later insertion after all, the grammar in this specific section is different from the rest of Judges 5, and is widely regarded as a later insertion after all. Pour one out for my boy Shamgar. Verses 9 to 11 are stanza 2, which calls upon Yahweh to bless the Israelites, and thanks him for winning them the battle. Stanza 3, verses 12 to 13, are Deborah and Barak telling their soldiers to capture the fleeing enemies, while stanza 4, verses 14 to 18, are a list of all the tribes who participated in the battle, and it thanks them for their bravery. Stanza 5, verses 19 to 23, describes the battle against the Canaanites, and curses the tribes who did not help, including Meroz. As I mentioned earlier, no one's quite sure who Meroz is. Stanza 6, verses 24 to 27, describes Yale's encounter with Sisera, and this is where the deviation happens. This is where she kills him while he's awake instead of in his sleep. Stanza 7 then concludes the song with verses 28 to 30. Verse 31 is also believed to be a later insertion, but unlike Shamgar's verse, scholars are not as sure about this one. Now I want to know, how many of you expected the Song of Deborah to be broken into seven stanzas? No shame if you didn't expect it, but the number seven appears a lot in the Bible, and this is just one example. Other examples include the seven days of creation, Joseph foretold seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, the Sabbath is on the seventh day, and more. Once again, this is a topic that deserves a video all on its own, but there are plenty of people out there who have already made videos about this. And I don't like math, which means you're getting the short answer. To the ancient Hebrews, the number seven represented completion in a cycle. So seven stanzas means the song has reached its conclusion. So after all that, I hope you can see why I think the Song of Deborah is so cool. This is an incredible artifact of ancient Israelite culture, because it gives us some insight as to how the Israelites viewed their history. The Song of Deborah is a way for the Israelites to recall the days of tribal confederation, before any kind of larger monarchy was established in the Holy Land. As I mentioned in the last episode, the ancient world was not always fond of feminine empowerment, but this song stands as a shining light in that misogynistic darkness. Am I saying the people who wrote this song were feminist? No, of course not. I'm simply saying it's a miracle we still have this song, despite centuries of misogynistic leadership. This song features not only a powerful woman, who is also a prophet I might add, but also a man who would not heed Yahweh's call to action, and because of that, he got his victory taken from him by a woman. However, a story we'll read in Judges 9, spoilers for a book that's been out for over 2,000 years, a man asks another man to kill him. He asks for this quick death because he doesn't want the shame of dying by a woman's actions. Based on this reading, one could say that the Song of Deborah exists not as a story of female empowerment, but as a warning to other men that they should be more decisive with their actions, lest their glory be taken by a woman. Now, that is certainly an interpretation you could take out of this story, but two things. One, 
Even if that was what the original author of Judges intended, a story's meaning evolves when it's in the hands of its readers. And this story has been in the hands of literally millions of readers over the centuries. And two, a story can definitely have multiple morals. This can simultaneously be a story about feminine empowerment and a story about how people should trust their deity. Throughout the Hebrew Bible, Yahweh uses people who are either doubtful of their own abilities or people who are assumed by others to be inept and not viewed with respect. Yet time and time again, they prove to be the right choice for the job, whether they be famous figures like Moses and David or lesser known judges like Ehud or Deborah. If Yahweh didn't think Deborah was capable enough to handle the tasks he assigned her, we wouldn't be talking about her now. Anyway, thank you for watching, leave a like if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you want to see more. I have a Discord where I post memes and updates on future videos. I also have several methods of supporting me if you think I should get paid for what I do. So until next time, happy Women's History Month.